Appendix B, Sexual Periodicity in Men, by F. H. Perry Cost, in Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. Kuzmarski. Appendix B, Sexual Periodicity in Men. In a recent brochure on the rhythm of the pulse, I showed inter alia that the readings of the pulse in both man and woman, if arranged in lunar monthly periods and averaged over several years, displayed a clear and sometimes very strongly marked symmetrical rhythm. After pointing out that, in at any rate some cases, the male and female pulse curves, both monthly and annual, seemed to be converse to one another, I added, it is difficult to ignore the suggestion that, in this tracing of the monthly rhythm of the pulse, we have a history of the monthly function in women, and that, if so, the tracing of the male pulse may eventually afford us some help in discovering a corresponding monthly period in men, the existence of which has been suggested by Mr. Havelock Ellis and Professor Stanley Hall, among other writers. Certainly, the mere fact that we can trace a clear monthly rhythm in man's pulse seems to point strongly to the existence of a monthly physiological period in him also. Obviously, however, it is only indirectly and by inference that we can argue from a monthly rhythm of the pulse in men to a male sexual periodicity. But I am now able to adduce more direct evidence that will fairly demonstrate the existence of a sexual periodicity in men. We will start from the fact that celibacy is profoundly unnatural, and is therefore a physical, as well as an emotional and intellectual, abnormality. This being so, it is entirely in accord with all that we know of physiology, that when relief to the sexual secretory system by nature's means is denied, and when, in consequence, a certain degree of tension or pressure has been attained, the system should relieve itself by a spontaneous spontaneous discharge such discharge being of course in the strict sense of the term pathological since it would never occur in any animal that followed the strict law of its physical being without any regard to other and higher laws of concern for its fellows notoriously that which we should have anticipated a prior actually occurs for any unmarried man who lives in strict chastity periodically experiences while sleeping a loss of seminal fluid such phenomena being popularly referred to as wet dreams during some eight or ten years i have carefully recorded the occurrence of such discharges as i have experienced myself and i have now accumulated sufficient data to justify an attempt to formulate some provisional conclusions in order to render these observations as serviceable as many be to students of periodicity i here repeat at the request of mr havelock ellis the statement which was subjoined for the same reasons to my rhythm of the pulse these observations upon myself were made between the ages of twenty and thirty-three i am about five feet nine inches tall broad-shouldered and weigh about ten stone three pounds net this weight being, I believe, about seven pounds below the normal for my height. Also, I have green-brown eyes, very dark brown hair, and a complexion that leads strangers frequently to mistake me for a foreigner. This complexion being, perhaps, attributable to some Huguenot blood, although on the maternal side I am, so far as all information goes, pure English. I can stand a good deal of heat, enjoy relaxing climates, am at once upset by bracing sea air, hate the cold, and sweat profusely after exercise. To this it will suffice 
to add that my temperament is of a decidedly nervous and emotional type before proceeding to remark upon the various rhythms which i have discovered i will tabulate the data on which my conclusions are founded the numbers of discharges recorded in the years in question are as follows in 1986 30 records commence in april in 1887 40 in 1888, 37, in 1889, 18, pretty certainly not fully recorded. In 1890, zero, no records kept this year. In 1891, 19, records recommenced in June. In 1892, 35, in 1893, 40, in 1894, 38, in 1895, 36, in 1896, 36, in 1897, 35, average 37, omitting 1886, 1889, and 1891. Thus, I have completed records for eight years, and incomplete records for three more, and the remarkable concord between the respective annual numbers of observations in these eight years not only affords us intrinsic evidence of the accuracy of my records, but also at once proves that there is an undeniable regularity in the occurrence of these sexual discharges and therefore gives us reason for expecting to find this regularity rhythmical moreover since it seemed reasonable to expect that there might be more than one rhythm i have examined my data with a view to discovering one an annual two a lunar monthly and three a weekly rhythm and i now proceed to show that all three such rhythms exist the annual rhythm it is obvious that in searching for an annual rhythm we must ignore the records of the three incomplete years but those of the remaining eight are graphically depicted upon chart eight the curves speak so plainly for themselves that any comment were almost superfluous and the concord between the various curves although of course not perfect is far greater than the scantiness of the data would have justified us in expecting the curves all agree in pointing to the existence of three well-defined maxima vis a in march june and september these being therefore the months in which the sexual instinct is most active and the latter curves show that there is also often a fourth maximum in january in the earlier years the march and june maxima are more strikingly marked than the september one but the upmost curve shows that on the average of all eight years the september maximum is highest the june and january maxima occupying the second place and the march maximum being the least strongly marked of all now remembering that in calculating the curves of the annual rhythm of the pulse i had found it necessary to average two months records together in order to bring out the full significance of the rhythm i thought it well to try the effect upon these curves also of similarly averaging two months together at first my results were fairly satisfactory but as my data increased year by year i found that these curves were contradicting one another and therefore concluded that i had selected unnatural periods for my averaging my first attempted remedy was to arrange the months in the pairs december january february march etc instead of an january february march april etc but with these pairs i fared no better than with the former i then arranged the months in the triplets january february march etc and the results were graphically recorded on chart seven here again comments would be quite futile but i need only point out that on the whole the sexual activity rises steadily during the first nine months in the year to its maximum in september and then sinks rapidly and abruptly during the next three to its minimum in december the study of these curves suggests two interesting questions to neither of which however do the data afford us an answer 
In the first place are the alterations, in my case, of the maximum of the discharges from March and June in the earlier years to September in the later, and the interpolation of a new secondary maximum in January correlated with the increase in age, or is the discrepancy due simply to a temporary irregularity that would have been equally averaged out had I recorded the discharges of 1881? to 89 instead of those from 1887 to 1897 the second question is one of very great importance socially ethically and physically how often in this climate should a man have sexual connection with his wife in order to maintain himself in perfect physiological equilibrium my results enable us to state definitely the minimum limits and to reply that thirty-seven embraces annually would be too few but unfortunately they give us no clue to the maximum limit it is obvious that the necessary frequency should be greater than thirty seven times annually possibly very considerably in excess thereof seeing that the spontaneous discharges with which we are dealing are due to overpressure and occur only when the system being denied natural relief can no longer retain its secretions and therefore it seems very reasonable to suggest that the frequency of natural relief should be some multiple of thirty seven i do not perceive however that the data in hand afford us any clue to this multiple or enable us to suggest either two three four or five as the required multiples of thirty seven it is true that other observations upon myself have afforded me what i believe to be a fairly satisfactory and reliable answer so far as concerns myself but these observations are of such a nature that they cannot be discussed here and i have no inclination to offer as a counsel to others an opinion which i am unable to justify by the citation of facts and statistics moreover i am quite unable to opine whether given thirty seven as the annual frequency of spontaneous discharges in a number of men the multiple required for the frequency of natural relief should be the same in every case for aught i know to the contrary the physiological idiosyncrasies of men may be so varied that given two men with an annual frequency of thirty seven spontaneous discharges the desired multiple may be in one case x and in the other two x our data however do clearly denote that the frequency in the six or eight summer months should bear to the frequency of the six or four winter months the proportion of three or four to two it should never be forgotten however that under all conditions both man and wife should exercise prudence with selfward and otherward and that each should utterly refuse to gratify self by accepting a sacrifice however willingly offered that may be gravely prejudicial to the health of the other for only experience can show whether in any union the receptivity of the woman be greater or less than or equal to the physical desire of the man to those of course who regard marriage from the old-fashioned and grossly immoral standpoint of melanchthon and other theologians and who consider a wife as the divinely ordained vehicle for the chartered intemperance of her husband it will seem grotesque in the highest degree that a physiological inquirer should attempt to advise them how often to seek embraces of their wives but those who regard women from the standpoint of a higher ethics who abhor the notion that she should be only the vehicle for her husband's passions and who demand that she shall be mistress of her own body will not be ungrateful for any guidance that physiology can afford them it will be seen presently moreover that the study of the weekly rhythm does afford us some less inexact clue to the desired solution one curious fact may be mentioned before we quit this interesting question it is stated that solon required of the husband three payments per month by the misna a daily debt was imposed upon an idle vigorous young husband twice a week on a citizen once in thirty days on a camel driver once in six months on a seaman 
now it is certainly striking that solon's three payments per month exactly corresponds with my records of thirty-seven discharges annually had solon similarly recorded a series of observations upon himself the lunar monthly rhythm we now come to that division of the inquiry which is of the greatest physiological interest although of little social import is there a monthly period in man as well as in woman my records indicate clearly that there is in searching for this monthly rhythm i have utilized not only the data of the eight completely recorded years but also those of the three years of eighteen eighty six eighteen eighty nine and eighteen ninety one for although it would obviously have been inaccurate to utilize these incomplete records when calculating the yearly rhythm there seems no objection to making use of them in the present section of the inquiry it is hardly necessary to remark that the terms first day of the month second day third day etc are to be understood as denoting new moon day day after new moon third lunar day and so on but it should be explained that since these discharges occur at night i have adopted the astronomical instead of the civil day so that a new moon occurring between noon yesterday and noon today is reckoned as occurring yesterday and yesterday is regarded as the first lunar day. Thus, a discharge occurring in the night between December 31st and January 1st is tabulated as occurring on December 31st, and in the present discussion is assigned to the lunar day comprised between noon of December 31st and noon of January 1st. Since it is obvious that the number of discharges in any one year, averaging as they do only 1.25 per day, are far too few to yield a curve of any value, I have combined my data in two series. The dotted curve on chart 9 is obtained by combining the results of the years 1886 to 92. Two of these years are incompletely recorded, and there are no records for 1890. The total number of observations was 179. The broken curve is obtained by combining those of the years 1893 to 97, the total number of observations being 185. Even so, the data are far too scanty to yield a really characteristic curve. But the continuous curve, which sums up the results of the seven years, is more reliable and obviously more satisfactory. If the two former curves be compared, it will be seen that, on the whole, they display a general concordance, such differences as exist being attributable chiefly to two facts one that the second curve is more even throughout neither maximum nor minimum being so strongly marked as in the first and two that the main maximum occurs in the middle of the month instead of on the second lunar day and the absence of the marked initial maximum alters the character of the first week or so of this curve it is however scarcely fair to lay any great stress on the characters of curves obtained from such scanty data and we will therefore pass to the continuous curve the study of which will prove more valuable now even a cursory examination of this continuous curve will yield the following results one the discharges occur most frequently on the second lunar day two the days of the next most frequent discharges are the twenty second the thirteenth the seventh twentieth and twenty sixth the eleventh and sixteenth so that if we regard only the first six of these we find that the discharges occur most frequently on the second seventh thirteenth twentieth twenty second and twenty sixth lunar days i e the discharges occur most frequently on days separated on the average by four day intervals but actually the period between the twentieth and twenty second days is that characterized by the most frequent discharges the days of minimum of discharge are the first fifth fifteenth eighteenth and twenty first four the curve is characterized by 
a continual seesawing so that every notable maximum is immediately followed by a notable minimum thus the curve is of an entirely different character from that representing the monthly rhythm of the pulse and this is only what one might have expected for whereas the mean pulsations vary only very slightly from day to day, thus giving rise to a gradual rising or sinking curve. A discharge from the sexual system relieves the tension by exhausting the stored-up secretion and is necessarily followed by some days of rest and inactivity. In the very nature of the case, therefore, a curve of this kind could not possibly be otherwise than most irregular if the discharges tended to occur most frequently upon definite days of the month and thus the very irregularity of the curve affords us proof that there is a regular male periodicity such that on certain days of the month there is greater probability of a spontaneous discharge than on other days gratifying however though this irregularity of the curve may be yet it entails a corresponding disadvantage for we are precluded thereby from readily perceiving the characteristics of the monthly rhythm as a whole i thought that perhaps this aspect of the rhythm might be rendered plainer if i calculated the data into two day averages and the result as shown in chart ten is extremely satisfactory here we can at once perceive the wonderful and almost geometric symmetry of the monthly rhythm indeed if the third maximum were one unit higher if the first minimum were one unit lower and if the lines joining the second minimum and third maximum and the fourth maximum and fourth minimum were straight instead of being slightly broken then the curve would in its chief features be geometrically symmetrical and this symmetry appears to me to afford a convincing proof of the representative accuracy of the curve we see that the month is divided into five periods that the maxima occur on the following pairs of days the nineteenth to twentieth thirteenth to fourteenth twenty fifth to twenty sixth first to second seventh to eighth and the minima occur at the beginning and an exact middle of the month there have been many idle superstitions as to the influence of the moon upon the earth and its inhabitants and some beliefs that once deemed equally idle have now been reinstated in the regard of science but it would certainly seem to be a very fascinating and very curious fact if the influence of the moon upon men should be such as to regulate the spontaneous discharges of their sexual system certainly the lovers of all ages would then have builded better than they knew and when they reared altars of devotional verse to that chaste goddess artemis the weekly rhythm we now come to the third branch of our inquiry and have to ask whether there be any weekly rhythm of the sexual activity a priori it might be answered that to expect any such weekly rhythm were absurd seeing that our week unlike the lunar month of the year is a purely artificial and conventional period while on the other hand it might be retorted that the existence of an induced weekly periodicity is quite conceivable such periodicity being induced by the habitual difference between our occupation or mode of life on one or two days of the week and that on the remaining days in such an inquiry however a priori argument is futile as the question can be answered only by an induction from observations and the curves on chart eleven chart eleven a and chart eleven b prove conclusively that there is a notable weekly rhythm the existence of this weekly rhythm being granted it would naturally be assumed that either the maximum or the minimum would regularly occur on saturday or sunday but an examination of the curves discloses the unexpected results that the day of maximum discharge varies from year to year thus it is sunday in 1888 1892 tuesday in 1894 
Thursday in 1886-1897, Friday in 1887, Saturday in 1893 and 1895. Since, in chart 11, the curves are drawn from Sunday to Sunday, it is obvious that the real symmetry of the curve is brought out in those years only which are characterized by a Sunday maximum, and accordingly, in chart 12, I have depicted the curves in a more suitable form. Chart 11 a is obtained by combining the data of 1888, 1892, and 1896, the years of a Sunday maximum. Curve 12b represents the results of 1894, the year of a Tuesday maximum, multiplied throughout by 3 in order to render the curve strictly comparable with the former. Curve 12c represents 1886 and 1897. The years of a Thursday maximum similarly multiplied by 1.5. In curve 12D, we have the results of 1887, the year of a Friday maximum, again multiplied by 3. And in curve 12E, those of 1893 and 1895, the years of a Saturday maximum, multiplied by 1.5. Finally, curve 12F represents the combined results of all nine years, plus the latter half of 1891. And this curve shows that, on the whole period, there is a very strongly marked Sunday maximum. I hardly think that these curves call for much comment. In their general character, they display a notable concord among themselves, and it is significant that the most regular of the five curves are A and E, representing the combinations of three years and of two years, respectively while the least regular is b which is based upon the records of one year only in every case we find that the maximum which opens the week is rapidly succeeded by a minimum which is itself succeeded by a secondary maximum usually very secondary although in eighteen ninety four it nearly equals the primary maximum followed again by a second minimum usually nearly identical with the first minimum after which there is a rapid rise to the original maximum the study of these curves fortunately amplifies the conclusion drawn from our study of the annual rhythm, and suggests that, in at least part of the year, the physiological condition of man requires sexual union at least twice a week. As to curve 12F, its remarkable symmetry speaks for itself. The existence of two secondary maxima, however, has not the same significance as had that of our secondary maximum in the preceding curves. For one of these secondary maxima is due to the influence of the 1894 curve with its primary Tuesday maximum, and the other to the similar influence of curve C with its primary Thursday maximum. Similarly, the veiled third secondary maximum is due to the influence of curve E, Probably any student of curves will concede that, on a still larger average, the two secondary maxima of curve F would be replaced by a single one on Wednesday or Thursday. One more question remains for consideration in connection with this weekly rhythm. Is it possible to trace any connection between the weekly and yearly rhythms of such a character that the weekly day of maximum discharge should vary from month to month in the year? In the other words, does the greater frequency of a Sunday discharge characterize one part of the year, that of a Tuesday another, and so on? In order to answer this question, I have recalculated all my data, with results that are graphically represented in chart 13. These curves prove that the Sunday maxima discharges occur in March and September, and the minima in June that the Sunday maxima discharges occur in September, Friday in July, and so on. Thus, there is a regular rhythm according to which the days of maximum discharge vary from one month of the year to another, and the existence of this final rhythm appears to me very remarkable.
I would especially direct attention to the almost geometric symmetry of the Sunday curve, and to the only less complete symmetry of the Thursday and Friday curves. Certainly, in these rhythms, we have an ample field for farther study and speculation. I have now concluded my study of this fascinating inquiry, a study that is necessarily incomplete, since it is based upon records furnished by one individual only. The fact, however, that even with so few observations, and notwithstanding the consequently exaggerated disturbing influence of minor irregularities, such remarkable and unexpected symmetry is evidenced by these curves, only increases one's desire to have the opportunity of handling a series of the observations sufficiently numerous to render the generalizations induced from them absolutely conclusive. I would again appeal to heads of colleges to assist this inquiry by enlisting in its aid a band of students. If only one hundred students, living under similar conditions, could be induced to keep such records with scrupulous regularity for only twelve months, the results induced from such a series of observations would be more than ten times as valuable as those which have only been reached after ten years' observations on my part. And if other countries of students in foreign and colonial colleges, e.g. in Italy, India, Australia, and America, could be similarly enlisted in this work, we should quickly obtain a series of results exhibiting the sexual needs and sexual peculiarities of the male human animal in various climates. Obviously, however, the records of any such student would be worse than useless unless their care and accuracy on the one hand and their habitual chastity on the other could be implicitly guaranteed end of appendix b recording by john thomas coos john thomas coos kuzmarski www.validateyourlife.com